by streamlining the subjects and giving them chapter headings to make for easy reading. Now, here's an important point. In the time of the early generations, all of these 18 sciences of Sharia existed, but they used to often be held under one heading and they would all be under one book. So then what would happen is one of the ulama, he would decide to write a book discussing that subject on its own to the exclusion of all other subjects. And this is where you would find these very elaborate books that dealt with the topic where they tried to focus on the topic by itself. Like for example, Tajweed was Imam, it was Imam Al-Khatib, Rahimullah, who actually wrote a book about Tajweed itself. Previously, Tajweed was not taught by itself. You learned Tajweed when you memorized Quran, when you learned Tafsir, and when you learned Fiqh because it was necessary to know it in order to know how to pray Salah, how to, uh, to say the Tashahud properly and other things, you had to know Tajweed. And so what happened though is some of the ulama began to uh, take these sciences and to write books that exclusively dealt with that science for latter generations who might not be able to gather all of the information under one dome and to then discuss it in all one sitting. This is so the scholars were thinking of us when they did this, the early generations. They were thinking there's going to be one brother that comes down the line and maybe he knows about tafsir, maybe he knows about fiqh, but he needs to know about tajweed. And that's all he wants to really deal with. So we're going to write a book that deals with this topic. Within the seerah of Ibn Hisham, those that have taken the seerah class can see there's a huge amount of tafsir in there. And it's seerah. Why? Because a lot of the scholars in that time had not separated Sira and Tafsir as separate sciences. They were held as one continuous, contiguous whole. But then in the third age, the latter part of the third age, you started to find people like Imam Ahmed rahimullah, writing a specific book on Tafsir of the Quran by itself. Just dealing with a book of tafsir by itself without discussing sira. Right? None of this would have been possible without the companions of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whether they were sent on a permanent basis or merely just to visit and teach, the number of teaching companions assigned to Basra was between three and ten thousand, including no less. Then Aisha as Siddiqa, our mother, radiallahu anha, Al Hassan, Al Hussein, Ali ibn Abi Talib, <coughs> radiallahu anhum ajma'in, and a galaxy of other great companions. The life that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, spent with his wives gave us snapshots of his personal life, domestic mannerisms, and things that could only be known by women. The other companions that focused on the things done in public, recorded matters diligently and put them into practice. Whether it was the way he spoke, his eating manners, or even instructions about the use of the toilet, all was recorded. So you had companions like Abdullah ibn Umar who since coming into the presence of the Prophet وسلم, used to even gesture like him. He changed the inflection of his voice so it was like his. He wore his clothes like his to the point to where once he was riding through Medina and he stopped his camel suddenly and got off. And someone said to him, why did you do that? And he said, I saw the Prophet ﷺ do it. So I wanted to do it. This is the character that the companions had. This is what they were focusing upon, the public and private practice. Everything that he'd done was recorded. The wives recorded the personal details that couldn't be known by men often. The personal details, some of them which included uh, visiting the toilet, or sexual intercourse, or husband and wife relations, and how to deal with these matters. They recorded these things because a prophet's life is not private property. Because a prophet is a teacher to the entire nation. 
And so they recorded these matters. The companions broke down everything, the eating manners, how he ate, the fact that he ate, when he did eat with his hands, he used his thumb, his index, and his middle finger for picking things up from the right hand off the plate. Not the whole hand. This is like a bear grabbing things. He used his thumb, his index, and his middle finger. And he would eat, taking things off of the plate, like this, in that fashion. And companions preserved this. And they looked into it. One companion said of himself once in a hadith in Sahih al-Jamia that my hand used to rove and roam the plate in reckless abandon. Until the Prophet ﷺ told me one day, say Bismillah and eat what's near to you from your right. Whereas before then he would be taking pieces from someone else's part of the plate, his own plate, perhaps using both hands, not even really eating food, sort of grasping it. So we had to be shown that you don't inhale food, that food is to be eaten. How do you use your hand to eat food? How do you make wudu? It's been preserved. For example, the hadith of Uthman عن, in the uh, Sunan of Ibn Majah, in which the Prophet وسلم, was with Uthman and he showed him the wudu, in which he did every aspect of wudu once. And he said, and, well, he did every aspect of wudu three times. And he said, this is the wudu of my ummah. And then he did the wudu and washing over every part twice. And he said, this is the wudu of the umam, the nations before me. And then he did the wudu in which he washed everything only one time. And he said, this is the wudu in which no worship will be accepted without it. So here we find we're being shown the sunan. We're being shown the farb, the wajib and the sunan. We're being shown them. He وسلم, is teaching us comprehensively. And the companions are there, either memorizing or writing it down. Remember, Uthman ibn Affan learned the Qur'an how? By, by standing behind the Prophet وسلم, and listening to it. It's not as we had sat down, reading from the Mus'haf. He learned it by actually standing behind him and listening to it. And over the course of a year, hearing the Qur'an, he memorized the speech of Allah. That's how he did it. He's what you call an audio learner. An audio learner. Prophecies, important dates in history, including the reset of the lunar calendar, were all things taken seriously. So when the lunar calendar was reset by Omar, there was a discussion regarding it. Where do we start from? What year do we start from? What month do we start from? What day do we start it on? Where do we start the calendar from? Some companions said, well, start it from when the Prophet ﷺ was born. And some said no. Some of the ulama said no. And he said, then we'll start it from when he died. And some of the companions were angry. They said, why would you start it from there? Wouldn't do that. And then some said, let's start from the hijrah. And Umar who agreed. And they said, we'll start dating the calendar from the date of the hijrah. First of Muharram, first year of hijrah, we shall start from there. So, passing on of incidents as eyewitnesses to revelation makes their witness all that more compelling and reputable. And this is an important thing. There are three ways of evaluating evidence. And I've said this before and I think it's important to say it again. There are three ways of evaluating evidence. Primary, secondary, and tertiary. The first form of evidence in discussing history or world events is primary data or primary evidence. This is by people who were actually there for those events. They are given the prime place in knowing about a particular historical event, utterance, or incident. The second in value are the secondary sources. These are people that knew the primary people. They knew the primary people. And so their veracity is judged on who they knew for the primary evidence. And the third and least of the proofs 
is tertiary evidence. This is someone who is the third in the link that knew the second one, which is the secondary evidence. And that person is judged the most rigidly because they're the most likely to slip because there's no one to correct them because they're after the events. So if someone was to talk about someone in this room, the eyewitness that would have the most knowledge of them would be the wife, the husband, the mother, the father. I would come somewhere down on the list, near the bottom perhaps. I'd probably be the third form canon of evidence because I don't know you well enough to say this is what this person is like. And so this is why it's important that the companions noted down all this information. Before moving on, it's very interesting that the main people that preserved this dean and recorded it and wrote it down were the staunchest enemies to this dean until the end. And that's something that's one of the mu'jiz, one of the miracles of Islam, is everyone expects that, of course, Abu Bakr would believe and he'd write down what he believed in the truth of Islam. But what about Abu Sufyan? What about Muawiyah? They were bankrupted when Islam came to Mecca and destroyed the idolatry and the interest. And these people were the primary carriers of Islam outside of Arabia. These people have been enemies of Allah moments before. And now they were preserving the deen. So it's one of the miracles of Islam. The step of actually writing down tafsir alone was began at the same time that Sirah was written down. Early pioneers included Abban, the son of Uthman ibn Affan, Az Zubayr ibn al Awam, and his son Urwa, Abu Huraira, Ibn Abbas, and Anas ibn Malik, just to name a few of the names. Other companions often recounted specific episodes such as war, end time prophecy, theology, but the aforementioned took the holistic approach. As Sirah branched into its own separate discipline, so too did tafsir in this time in which the importance of recording the language of Qur'an and the Sunnah, the reasons for revelation and application of its judgments became paramount. The first person who we have written down that systematically did this was our Sayyid, Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. This book is one of the most important. This is Tanweer al-Maqbas min Tafsir ibn Abbas. This is ibn Abbas's Tafsir. This is a 1,200-year-old, well, 1,300-year-old Tafsir. There are copies of this in Berlin, in Baghdad. And for those that want to do a little bit of research, they should know that this tafsir was handed down and we know the veracity of it because Imam Ahmed used to quote from it in huge sections of his own tafsir and the portions that he's, he's quoted I've checked them with this and they coincide Imam Ahmed also mentioned there being copies in Egypt when he visited Egypt so we can see that this book was known because some people will try to cast doubt upon the veracity of this tafsir. But Ahmed knew about it, had copies of the manuscripts. And so this is the earliest tafsir in which you will look inside of this and you will see the perspective ayat on the top and then the commentary on the ayat on the bottom. Ibn Abbas does not go into the fiqh, he does not go into those things. Solely Ibn Abbas is giving why the verse was revealed, what it means, and how it is applied. It is one large volume. Where did he get this from? Ibn Abbas went through the whole Quran with the Prophet three times. So you are looking at the distillation of all of this knowledge. He is one of the sources for the Shafi'i school, Ibn Abbas So this is the earliest specimen that we have to examine what tafsir looked like. The earliest specimen. The 
The followers of the companions wrote down the words with great care, checking dates, 